Now there was no difficulty in doing this, for my income was larger, but the society itself was in debt. The quarterly bills which I and others were instructed to draw were often met with borrowed money, and the correspondence commenced which terminated in the following year by my resigning from conscientious motives. To me it seemed that the teaching of God's word was unmistakably clear. Owe no man anything. To borrow money implied to my mind a contradiction of Scripture, a confession that God has withheld some good thing and a determination to get for ourselves what he has not given. Could that which was wrong for one Christian be right for an association of Christians? Or could any amount of precedence make a wrong course justifiable? If the word taught me anything, it taught me to have no connection with debt. I could not think that God was poor, that he was short of resources, or unwilling to supply any want of whatever work was really his. It seemed to me that if there were lack of funds to carry on work, then to that degree, in that special development, or at that time, it could not be the work of God. To satisfy my conscience, I was therefore compelled to resign my connection with the society. It was a great satisfaction to me that my friend and colleague, Mr. Jones, was led to take the same step, and we were both profoundly thankful that the separation took place without the least breach of friendly feeling on either side. The step we had taken was not a little trying to faith. I was not at all sure what God would have me to do, or whether he would so meet my need as to enable me to continue working as before. But God blessed and prospered me, and how glad and thankful I felt when the separation was really effected. I could look right up into my father's face with a satisfied heart, ready by his grace to do the next things as he might teach me, and feeling very sure of his loving care. And how blessedly he did lead me I can never, never tell. It was like a continuation of some of my earlier experiences at home. My faith was not untried. It often, often failed. And I was so sorry and ashamed of the failure to trust such a father. But, oh, I was learning to know him. I would not even then have missed the trial. He became so near, so real, so intimate. The occasional difficulty about funds never came from any insufficient supply for personal need but in consequence of ministering to the wants of scores of the hungry and dying around us. And trials far more searching in other ways quite eclipsed these difficulties, and being deeper brought forth and, in consequence, richer fruits. That winter, thousands of homeless refugees poured into Shanghai from districts devastated by the ongoing Taiping Rebellion. Some of these sick, starving, Often naked refugees lived in cemeteries where they found shelter by breaking into low-arched tombs. Others crowded into any abandoned building, even those in ruins. And although Hudson took charge of one of the chapels of the London Mission and preached daily in the city temple, he went regularly into the haunts of misery to care for sick refugees and to feed many of the hungry. But no matter how busy he was, Hudson's thoughts turned constantly to Ningpo. Could God be in the feelings he was having? He had to be sure. Back in Ningpo, unknown to Hudson, the one he loved was thinking just as much about him. And though Maria also prayed about her own growing feelings, she told no one but God, for she realized that no one else saw what she saw in Hudson Taylor. He was different from others, not more gifted or attractive, though he was bright, pleasant, and seemed to be fun-loving. There was just something about him that made her feel rested and understood. He seemed to live in such a real world and to have such a real great God. Though she hadn't seen that much of him during his time in Ningpo, she was startled to find how much she missed him when he left for Shanghai. She heard others criticize his Chinese dress, but she loved it. At least she loved what it represented of his spirit. She also respected his poverty and generous giving to the destitute. His vision to take the gospel to the interior was her vision as well, though it seemed so impractical for a woman. 
So she thought and prayed about her friend during that long winter he was away in Shanghai, even though she had no assurance of his feeling for her. Love finally conquered the silence. Hudson sent Marie a letter declaring his feelings and asking if she would consent to become engaged. The first thing Maria did when she got the letter was to search out her sister and share her wonderful news. Then the two of them went to talk to Miss Aldersey, whose response was indignant. Mr. Taylor? That young, poor, unconnected nobody? How dare he presume to think of such a thing? Of course the proposal must be refused at once, and that finally. Maria tried to explain how much she felt for him, and that only made matters worse. Miss Aldersey decided Maria must be saved from such folly. The result was a letter, dictated by Miss Aldersey, but written by Maria, not only closing the matter, but requesting most decidedly that it might never be reopened. Bewildered and heartbroken, Maria felt she had no choice. She was too young and inexperienced and too shy in such matters to stand up against Miss Aldersey's decision. And in the long, lonely days that followed, even when her sister was won over to Miss Aldersey's position, she prayed with a determined faith that nothing, nothing at all was too hard for the Lord. If he has to slay my Isaac, she assured herself again and again, I know he can restore. Yet she wondered if she would ever see Hudson again. When Hudson did return to Ningpo that spring, the situation grew even more painful. Hudson, after the letter he received from Maria, could not attempt to see her, yet his feelings for her remained unchanged, and she had no way to let him know that the letter she had written wasn't any indication of her true emotions. Meanwhile, Miss Aldersey, distressed at Hudson Taylor's reappearance, felt it her duty to disparage him in every possible way, not just to Maria, but throughout the foreign community in Ningpo. His Chinese dress became the object of criticism and scorn, and his new status as independent missionary not connected to any recognized mission made him an even better target for criticism. He was accused of being called by no one, connected with no one, and recognized by no one as the minister of the gospel. Other insinuations soon followed. He was fanatical, undependable, diseased in body and mind, and totally worthless. As a gifted and attractive young woman, Maria had no lack of other suitors who were openly encouraged by Miss Aldersey. At the same time, Chinese etiquette, combined with his intention to honor the request of her letter, made it look impossible for Hudson to meet with Maria. Yet both young people continued praying for some indication of God's will. Then one sultry day in July, at the end of an afternoon prayer meeting of missionary women at the Jones's house, a storm swept up the tidal river and deluged Ningpo with sudden torrents of rain. Those women who hadn't left included Marie Dyer and one of her closest friends, and they could do nothing but wait until the storm blew over. When Mr. Jones and Hudson returned to the house from the dispensary next door to learn that Maria and her companion were still waiting for sedan chairs, Hudson's friend, who knew about his feelings for Maria, said to him, Go into my study and I will see what can be arranged. A short while later, Hudson's friend came downstairs to tell him that Maria and her friend were now the only ladies left. They were alone with Mrs. Jones and would be glad to see him. Hardly believing his good fortune, his heart pounding in anticipation, Hudson went upstairs to see Maria for the first time in months. He saw nothing in the room but her face, and when he asked her permission to write to her guardian back in England, she quickly and eagerly consented. At the same time, she let him know she felt the same love for him that he'd expressed for her. They recognized the obstacles still before them, but they determined together to keep praying for God's leading in their situation. Finally, knowing the truth of their mutual love brought indescribable joy to the young couple, but it did nothing for their patience as they waited for a response to Hudson's letter to Maria's uncle, and it made the continuance of Miss Aldersey's enforced separation seem all the more trying. Four months stretched out like an eternity, especially when they knew Miss Aldersey had written home with the same accusation she had been voicing around Ningpo. What if Maria's uncle was persuaded by her charges? 
What if he refused his consent to the marriage? Both young people felt that God's blessing depended on their obedience to those in parental authority. Taylor wrote later, later, I've never known disobedience to the definite command of a parent, even if that parent was mistaken. This was followed by retribution. The responsibility is with the parent in such a case, and it is a serious one. When the son or daughter can say in all sincerity, I am waiting for thee, Lord, to open the way, the matter is in his hands, and he will take it up. One day, near the end of November, patience and faith were both rewarded. The letter arrived. After careful inquiry, Maria's uncle in London had satisfied himself that Hudson Taylor was a missionary of unusual promise. The secretaries of the Chinese Evangelization Society had nothing but good to say of him, and he got nothing but praise from other sources. So, dismissing the unfair criticism for what it was, he cordially consented to his niece's engagement, requesting only that the marriage be delayed until she became of age. Her 21st birthday would be less than two months away. Hudson could scarcely contain his excitement. He had to tell Maria the news. But how? Under the circumstances, he couldn't rush to the school and ask to see her. There was, in fact, no place at the school appropriate for a private meeting to discuss their plans, and his own home was out of the question as well. But when one of the missionary wives from the American Baptist Mission Board heard of his dilemma, she devised a plan to get the couple together. She lived in a quiet place outside the city wall and close to the river. She would send a note to the school asking Maria to visit her at her home. And if somebody else just happened to be there when she arrived, well, such things happen. So it was in Miss Knowlton's drawing room that Hudson waited while a messenger crossed the river to the school. Finally, he heard Maria's voice in the hall. The door opened, and they were together, alone for the first time. More than forty years later, Hudson Taylor said of that moment, We sat side by side on the sofa, her hand clasped in mine. It never cooled my love for her, and it is not cooled now. Once they were publicly and officially engaged, they began making up for all the time they had been kept apart. Maria's birthday was on January 16, so the wedding was planned for the following week. Several times that winter, Hudson Taylor's finances dwindled to almost nothing. Once his funds were down to one twentieth of a cent before an unexpected shipment of mail arrived with additional funds from supporters back home. Encouraged as he was by such last-minute provision for his needs, he realized again how little he had to offer a wife. He explained his precarious financial situation to Maria, saying, I cannot hold you to your promise if you would rather draw back. You see how difficult our life may be at times. Have you forgotten? she interrupted. I was left an orphan in a far-off land. God has been my father all these years. Do you think I shall be afraid to trust him now? My heart did sing for joy, Hudson said, recalling the story, and his excitement is obvious in a letter he penned to his mother. I never felt in better health or spirits in my life. I can scarcely realize, dear mother, what has happened, that after all the agony and suspense we've suffered, we are not only at the liberty to meet and to be much with each other, but within a few days we are to be married. God has been so good to us. He has indeed answered our prayer and taken our part against the mighty. Oh, may we walk more closely with him and serve him more faithfully. I wish you knew my precious one. She's such a treasure. She is all that I desire. And then six weeks later, Oh, to be married to the one you do love and love most tenderly and devotedly. That is bliss beyond the power of words to express or imagination to conceive. There is no disappointment there. And every day, as it shows more of the mind of your beloved, when you such a treasure as mine, makes you only more proud, more happy, more humbly thankful to the giver of all good for these best of earthly gifts. The year 1858 and 1859. In the first months after their wedding, Hudson and Maria Taylor broke ground for a small home and headquarters in a rural district a few miles out of Ningpo. Surrounded by a large fishing population, 
they spent a happy month preaching of Christ to people who had never heard the gospel.